Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is when you are listening to this podcast. I'm your host, Paul Weaver. I have the wonderful privilege each and every week of leading conversations with some of the best Bible scholars and Bible expositors. And this week is no exception. I'm pleased to have Pastor Ed Underwood on the program today and next week. Pastor Underwood is a pastor to pastors. He's the executive officer and lead counselor of the Recentered Group. Prior to this, he pastored for over 40 years, including the historic church known as Church of the Open Door in Southern California. He's a highly sought after conference speaker and author of the book, When God Breaks Your Heart, and the book, Reborn to be Wild, among others. He came to faith in Jesus Christ during the Jesus Revolution, and his book, Reborn to be Wild, records some of those momentous days And that is what we're going to talk about in this episode. Pastor Underwood, welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. It's great to be with you, Paul. It's great to be talking to a prof from my beloved seminary, ETS. (laughs) Those were great days. When I was there, it was electric because about 40% of us were Jesus movement dudes. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we rocked the boat. <laughs> oh, that's, I would have enjoyed being in the classroom with uh, 40% of those. Well, you might have. <laughs> <laughs> Was Greek, Greek and Hebrew class must have been pretty unique. <laughs> oh, gosh. We were, uh, yeah. I don't know if we have time for this story, but I remember one time I was sitting with two other Jesus movement dudes. Uh, they came to Christ through what used to be, camp, it's now Crew Campus Crusade, uh-huh. and I was more of a young life guy. But we were in uh, uh, Dan Wallace's. Uh, Mm -hmm. Greek class. And he was talking about, um, he was uh, talking about uh, future hope. He said, eschatological hope. And I was just sitting there, you know, thinking, what? And I went to my two buddies. I go, what does that mean? They said, man, I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) There were a bunch of moody grads there shaking their hands. And we were like, okay, whatever. (laughs) We didn't, we wanted to fit in. I also remember that the chaplain, used to close the hymn book and he'd say, just close your hymn books. Everybody knows the words. No, we didn't. (laughs) Well, that's exciting. Well, we share that in common. Uh, I had Dr. Wallace as well about 20 years ago. So uh, you you had him as a very young, he must've been a very young man when you had him. It was his first year and and we've become good friends. And I still, I told him I still haven't forgiven him. (laughs) Well, very cool. I'm very excited to have our conversation today and learn about your experience. Uh, Before we get to the contents of your book, Reborn to be Wild, would you share with our listeners about the ministry you lead now, the Recentered Group? The the pastor is so lonely Mm -hmm. that I just told Judy, I'm tired of living alone. And we brought together four couples that we've known for years and years and years. One pastor, one is an executive in a shoe company. The other one is a is a uh, TV director from Dallas, as a matter of fact. And uh, I told them early on that I thought my time was up as a lead pastor. And I said, but I'd like to help pastors. I, uh, I've been fighting a battle all my life to do what matters most to Jesus, and that's to make disciples and love one another. And it seems like everything else is happening. And the TV director dude, um, a guy named Dave Burchett, who's on our board, said, why don't you call it Recentered? And that's how Recentered started. And uh, so Judy and I started our this little 501c3, and we've been doing it since I left uh, Church of the Open Door. So it's been six years. I pastored COD for uh, 21 years, uh, beat Dr. McGee, who was only there 20. Can't wait till I get to heaven and say, uh, you had a radio ministry, but I was there one year more. <laughs> that's probably sinful. But uh, anyway, um, So what we do now is we have seminars. I do a lot of counseling. I don't really, I'm not really a counselor. I'm more of a shepherd to shepherds, but I try to help churches get healthy. Uh, It's very sad to me that so many churches that are so good doctrinally and they're such, they emphasize grace so much. Their leadership is, um, is really just 
messed up, you know? Um, so that's what I, that's what I do. Yeah. And, uh, and then also try to help a lot of pastors really don't know how to build a disciple making culture. So those are the two things I do. I help them build unity I encourage, uh, pastors and then help them make a disciple making, build a disciple making culture. That's great. Pastors need shepherds, don't they? That's for sure. Oh man, man, it's a lonely group. You know, the average, well, you know, the statistics, they're horrible. They're horrible. And I have some of my, some of the guys that I went to seminary with, who I would say are the most talented, mm. uh, are no longer in the ministry. I mean, they were, they tapped out three, four years after we graduated just mm. because they got chewed up by mm. the church. Mm. Yeah. Well, someone that's interested in contacting you, maybe to work with their leadership team, maybe to be encouraged personally or to speak at a men's conference or a Bible conference, how can they get a hold of you? Just go to recenteredgroup.com. Everything's there. You're going to find out more about me than you ever want to know. Well, you've had a lot of experiences and we're looking forward to getting into some of those discussions uh, in the first chapter of your book. Let's talk about that. Reborn okay. to be wild. Uh, you write, now I'm quoting, I don't have to wonder what it would be like to be a part of a genuine revival. I lived through one in the late sixties and seventies. I was there. I didn't meet Jesus in a church. I met him on the streets of Bakersfield. Uh, the recently released movie, the Jesus revolution has led to a great deal of interest in the revival uh, during those days. Well, would you comment on your thoughts about the accuracy or inaccuracy of that movie? And then a general atmosphere of, of what was going on during those days. Uh, well, we knew who Lonnie Frisbee was. Everybody knew who Lonnie Frisbee was. He was the guy in Hollywood who, who started the whole thing. We knew who Chuck Smith was. Uh, he was uh, in Southern California. And we saw the pictures of the baptisms at Costa Mesa, at Pirate's Cove uh, there. And uh, so we knew all about it. Uh, but we were, um, you know, Greg Laurie was part of that. So the Jesus Revolution is about Calvary Chapel and that whole aspect of it. And ours was to was a different stream. It was the Jesus movement and we were Jesus freaks, but ours came more through uh, the parachurch of uh, Young Life and what we used to call Campus Crusade for Christ, Navigators. That was where it came from. Our influencers were uh, a lot of Dallas Seminary grads, yeah. uh, Howard Hendricks, my pastor, our Jesus movement pastor there in Bakersfield was uh, a Dallas grad. That's why I went to Dallas uh, yeah. later. Um, a lot of young, moody influence. Young uh, Life and Campus Crusade were still. Oh, Young right? Life was yes. our main thing. Nice. I was a part of Young Life, but we, you know, we kind of crossed over. We all we all ended up in the same churches because nobody wanted us except a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was all it was that, and it was uh, so it, it was a very interesting movie. I, I found out a lot of things I didn't know about Greg Glory and his life, and mm -hmm. uh, but uh, our experience was totally different. It, it mm -hmm. centered around Campus Crusade for Christ, Young Life, Navigators, and the few churches that mm -hmm. would uh, that invited us. Very mm -hmm. few. So that that's good for our listeners and viewers to be aware of that. Uh, it's yeah, going on also, all over the place. Uh, it's not all monolithic. Everything's not the no, same. It wasn't, in every location. But, but what was monolithic is when I wrote reborn to be wild, I did research on, I graduated from high school in 1968. That's how old I am. Uh, but um, it, it is seen by historians as the most tumultuous year in American history. Hmm. So we were an angry group of young people. And I mean, I remember thinking, um, you know, I was a, I was a partier. I was just off. I was on the streets, man. I was just, I, I, uh, uh, Jesus was half a cuss word. <laughs> that was about right. it for me. And I just thought, you know, uh, I'm going to die in Vietnam. So what the heck? And, and that was, that's where we were. And that's, that's where the revival came out of that angry generation shows you the power of the Holy spirit. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, before, we're going to get to your salvation story and all of all of the events surrounding that. But before we do, tell us a little bit about your family's religious background or, or lack thereof. It, it'd be mostly a uh, lack thereof. Um, uh, my, my wife, Judy, and I are both first-generation Christians. Um, uh, I led both my mom and my dad to Christ hmm. uh, later on. Uh, but so I church was 
you know, Sunday was when I watched football and read the funny papers and uh, never, ever went to church. My mother had come from a, a more of a Pentecostal background. Uh, she called them holy rollers and she had rejected everything. So the only time I ever went to church, my grandmother went to this little Pentecostal church and uh, we would have to go out there on Mother's Day. Um, and uh, it was all foreign to me. I didn't know anything about it, you know. Um, but it was like uh, they would have this pack of pew for Jesus time where <laughs> the grandmother who brought the most. So we kind of went out of guilt. But that that was it. I mean, I, I, I knew nothing about church. Absolutely nothing. Well, Pastor Ed, in your book, Reborn to be Wild, you write, To us, grace was so much more than a theological position. It was our life, the air we breathed, and the new reality of our existence. Would you comment further? Yeah, you know, it was just all we knew. Um, no one had to tell us that we needed to be rescued. And I remember thinking, man, if there's a hell, I'm going there. And when I heard the message of grace uh, through uh, Young Life, I can talk about that. But I just remember thinking, it's just too good to be true. It's mm. too good to be true. But it was all we knew and all we experienced mm. in the stewards of the Jesus movement. They were all grace people. And I remember just being so excited about grace and thinking about the uh, free gift of salvation and and uh, and the power of God. We were we were taught that, and uh, so it wasn't a theology. Um, and I really didn't know it was a theology until I got to DTS. That's when I understood there's a theology of grace. Why do we need one of those? I mean, let's just be there. As you think of the groups that did make a, a dent for the glory of God, it was people that did emphasize grace, of course, that wouldn't, legalism wouldn't be appealing in any way to. Oh, gosh, no. There's no way we can measure up. I can tell you, I was at a Young Life gathering. I've been a Christian like a minute, and I got excited, and I started talking, and the words that came out of my mouth were the words that I was using last week, you know? I said a lot of bad words just out of excitement. I mean, I meant them in a good way and I was so shamed and I walked outside. I still remember sitting down outside and our young life leader, a guy named Keith came out and put his arm around me. He said, Ed, growth comes slowly. You're okay. And that's grace. Hmm. That was grace. So he's patient with you. That's great. Yeah, very, very patient. Yeah. Well, they had to be. We're going to talk about some lessons that can be learned at the end of this podcast, and that certainly is one of them, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Grace motivates, and it's winsome. Hmm. It's recorded in your book, Reborn to be Wild, and you write about a friend named Bobby. And now I'm quoting, he used to do everything with us. He was our contact at the local grocery store where he stocked shelves. We would give Bobby the money to pay for the massive amounts of beer we needed for the weekend. And he would put the money in the cash register before sneaking cases of cores in bottles out the back door in big toilet paper boxes because we wouldn't want to steal. So you had some, you had some, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh pretty low bar, but we had some <laughs> ethic ethics there. You go on and say people like Bobby were everywhere. On every football team, in every car club, every drinking buddies club, every neighborhood, every dorm, every locker room. You go on to say every anything and that gathered high school and college students together. There was a Bobby, someone who had just discovered the grace and mercy of God who refused to stop talking about Jesus. Would you tell us more about Bobby and, and another individual you discuss in your book, Phil, and uh, what you write about them that led you to what you call the most miserable months of your life. Yeah, they were the most miserable months of my life. I was, uh, I had graduated from, from high school. I'd always been a real smart guy. I'd done real well. And then, uh, I just spun out my senior year of high school. Uh, what college wasn't on the horizon. I had done so badly. I just thought I was going to go to Vietnam. So heck with it. And I, I was just partying. And these guys, uh, Bobby and Phil, were partying with me. Uh, Phil was the president of the Drinking Buddies Club. We were very, <laughs> we had it all figured out. Nice. I was a vice president. And Bobby, of course, was a treasurer because okay. he worked at this, at this, at this place. And uh, we just partied all the time. And then the Jesus movement 
hit Bakersfield. Mm. It just hit there. I mean, it was like a wave. And our friends started dropping like flies. And we would have conversations. I had them with Bobby and Phil. I said, I can't believe these Jesus freaks. These guys, I don't even want to be around them anymore. Mm. And then Bobby, uh, uh, first Phil, Phil, who's now my brother-in-law and a, and a uh -huh. missionary, wonderful, one, wonderful man, wonderful story. He's a missionary statesman, unbelievable man. Mm. Uh, but Phil, Phil dropped first in our, from our eyes. <laughs> and then Bobby, and Bobby was a really good friend of mine. Mm. And, uh, and it was just miserable. It was my first year working as a fireman for the Forest Service. So I was up in the mountains, um, and I would come down on weekends, and they had just changed. We couldn't, and they had this, they had this thing. They did this, this is crazy things that happened during the Jesus movement. They rented a ranch out in the country in Bakersfield, and it was called, they called it the ranch. And all the young life people would, would gather out there, and, um, and the Youth for Christ was just a gathering. And the, these three guys rented this place and kept it going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were always inviting me out. I wasn't about to go. And one night, Bobby, but uh, Bobby called me one night and he said, why don't you come out to the ranch? I said, Bobby, I was off. I wasn't working that way. I had a day off from the forest service. And I said, Bobby, I'm not coming out there, man. You're going to be talking that Jesus. I'll just use the word stuff. Yeah. Um, and I don't want anything to do with it. And he said, well, just come on out. So I went out and, and he had made a meal and it was, and it was like old times. He was kind to me. Um, he didn't say anything. And he said, Hey, there's a guy named Mo Smith. Uh, and Mo was from Chico. Now, I knew about Mo. Mo was from Chico. He was a Jesus movement dude who went to Chico state. He drove, uh, a real, a real cool, um, a real cool car. And everybody thought Mo was the coolest thing since went butter. But I also know that he was a Jesus dude. And he said, hey, Mo's on his way down to L.A. from Chico. Uh, he's coming by tonight. You know, why don't you, why don't you stay up? I said, no, I'm going to go to bed. I went to bed, but I didn't sleep. And I was listening. And I heard, this is so moving to me still today. I heard Bobby and Mo Smith praying for me. And as far as I know, that's the first time anybody had ever prayed for me in my entire life. And I remember driving home from that, from, from the ranch the next morning thinking, these guys are praying to God for me. Man, they were praying their heart. We just pray for Eddie. They called me Eddie, of course. Um, so that was it. Yeah, that was, uh, I wasn't an easy, an easy convert at all. Well, that's, that's powerful to, to hear that story and and uh, that led to you why well, that's why you say that most miserable months of your life because you're really grappling with these oh issues, i was under right? so much conviction and and bobby and phil were being so kind to me how about the time when you placed your faith in christ after all well, of that conviction uh so i told bobby that i was going down to la um i was going down to um there was a junior college the bakersfield renegades they were playing in la and I said, I think while I'm there, that was, that was, uh, Billy Graham's big Anaheim crusade. That's, I mean, that's all this was happening, you know, all around me. Um, and I said, I think I'll go by and see Billy Graham and listen to Billy Graham. So we get down there, I'm with my drinking buddies. And instead of going to hear Billy Graham, we went to Tijuana. So you can imagine, um, Anyway, so I came back and Bob came over, Bobby came over that Sunday night and he said, did you, did you hear Billy? We called Billy Graham, Billy, you know? And I said, nah, you know, we went, my buddy's down to Tijuana. I started talking to him and he looked at me and he said, he just said, Eddie, I'm going home. And he left. So I turned on the television and Billy Graham was on. And I can't remember a thing that he said. I really don't. And I said, I'm going to go see Bobby. And I drove, Bobby lived about two blocks away. And I drove over there. Bobby lived in a cul-de-sac. By the time I got there, I thought, this is crazy. I, this Jesus stuff. I don't want anything. Bobby was standing in his front yard. And I stopped by, talked to him. And he said, let's go see Keith. And, you know, now that I've been a pastor, it was like 9 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. And Keith Osborne, who was our Young Life leader, 
drove up. We were out in the front yard waiting for him. I'm just thinking he must have been so tired. And uh, we sat on a curve in Bakersfield, California. He told me about the grace of God. I trusted Christ right there. And you mentioned in the book, he, like many others, right, gave up lucrative careers to be engaged oh, yeah. in, in this movement and reaching yeah. young people with the gospel of Christ. Yeah, yeah. He was the first to embrace me and to disciple me. Yeah, that was Keith. Yeah. And then came Ted, who was our Jesus movement pastor. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's the one church that, that yeah. invited us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure <laughs> and he got some flack for that, right? <laughs> oh, oh, he did. He did. I, I, I knew him later. He was pastoring a church in Houston when I was at DTS. Uh -huh. And it was only then that I heard the stories of all the persecution they came under. Uh -huh. Wow. Uh, from inviting us and letting us have our music. So you could resonate with what you saw in the Jesus revolution. Oh yeah. Chuck Smith oh, yeah. and what he faced. Yeah. Yeah. He, he was a courageous dude. All of them were mm -hmm. who stood for us. All of them were courageous. Yeah. Well, in the second chapter of your book, the chapter is entitled taking God to the streets. Uh, you write, it's amazing the things God did not use to move this revival forward. No books about we grew our church with this grand scheme or that newest insight. No big donors getting behind a vision for reaching the world for Christ. Not a new paradigm for church leadership that would make pastors and their churches suddenly relevant. Um, would you comment more about that? Yeah, I mean, it was not trendy. I mean, there was nothing trendy about it. I, the reason I wrote Reborn was I was looking at all these uh, scholastic articles on the Jesus movement, and, and they didn't get it. Hmm. They thought it was a trendy. They thought it was a rock. Of course, we did have the rock music and the long hair and all that, but hmm. um, it wasn't any of that. We were persecuted. Hmm. I remember being at uh, UC Santa Barbara in a philosophy class. This was after I trusted Christ. And... Um, and uh, the philosophy uh, uh, professor wrote, uh, we were uh, studying the theories of, of knowledge. And uh, he wrote, I know that my redeemer liveth on the board. And I thought, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> and he said, who would say that? And, I, and this guy kind of liked me, you know? And I raised my hand. And he said, you? And another guy raised his hand. So we were persecuted. Hmm. Um, and we had a, we would hold up one finger. That was our, that was our symbol. Hmm. Like they used the fish in the, in the new Testament. We used mm -hmm. the one finger and that meant one way, hmm. one way, dude, one way to heaven. And that was our little secret signal. And everybody started kind of screaming at us. These Jesus freaks, you know, and all that. And he looked at me and he went, he held up that one finger. Hmm. Um, that's what it was about. We were persecuted, but we were loved. I would say that we were loved into the kingdom. Hmm. We were loved and, uh, we were discipled. We had community. Hmm. Uh, we hung out at places we couldn't get enough. Uh, we took buses down to Arrowhead Springs where the, um, where campus crusades headquarters were. And we listened to any Bible teacher that we could hear, um, and, uh, but we were discipled. We were, uh, we had layered discipleship. Mm -hmm. There were our young life leaders, campus crusade for Christ. They have, anyway, we were discipled. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it was just real and it was relational. And so those who are critical and for some good reason of the second great awakening, when we think of Charles Finney and thinking about orchestrating things in such a way to yeah. clinch a response, this is far from that. It was very yeah, different. I mean, it was like, yeah, it was just, it was just, it was, it was happening. And, and, you know, I didn't I orchestrate it in the 60s just... way, but it was, it was life. It's, it was, it was what was happening. It was what God was doing. And it was everywhere. Yeah. It was just everywhere. Now, when I researched Reborn to be Wild, I found out that there were pockets of the Jesus movement and uh, some places were never touched. Uh -huh. by the Jesus movement. <laughs> I'll tell you the story about Phil, the guy who is now my brother-in-law. He came to take me to church. And I said, uh, I don't want to go to church today. There's a good football game. And I still remember he came in and said, I'll watch it with you. I'll watch it with you. And then I went to church with him. I tried going to a few churches and it didn't work out well. Mm -hmm. And I still remember 
um, I walked in, I was wearing Levi's. I remember thinking, and Ted was preaching in the pulpit. Uh, he was a Dallas guy. And he looked and he said, Hey, Phil, I see you got a buddy with you. You guys are wearing Levi's. I love it when people come to church in Levi's. I remember thinking, whoa, <laughs> this is different. And when I preached at, uh, at Ted's funeral, I wore Levi's. Hmm. And uh, I got as much flack as he did. But anyway, that was, um, that was the way it was, yeah. Interesting. Fascinating, yeah. Well, um, in your book, Reborn to be Wild, you also write about how you were thrust into leadership shortly after being saved. I found that interesting. You write, and now I'm quoting, I just assumed this was the way it happened for everyone. You get saved, spend a few weeks learning about Jesus, then start doing something important for him. I didn't know I was in the middle of a revival. Tell us more about those early days of your ministry. Well, I talked to Keith, who was our uh, young life leader, and um, and and uh, he and Bobby, uh, Phil was more involved with Campus Crusade, uh, so he and Bobby, Bobby was, in, was involved in young life, and uh, they said, why don't you go to another high school? Uh, Bakersfield High School was a, a big high school, and they said, why don't you just go and hang out? and act like a leader. And I said, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> I was doing that. And I was just going there and I'm listening. There was a guy named Bill Baker. He's now a doctor in Bakersfield. And Bill Baker was the leader and, um, and a great guy. He played football on the, at the junior college and all that. And I was just going to a leadership meeting one day. And I'd been a Christian three weeks. Hmm. I was at a leadership meeting one day and Bill said, Hey, I got a I got a scholarship to play football at uh, San Diego State, so I'm moving to San Diego, and we're going to need a new leader. And I'm thinking, hmm, yeah, great. And he said, I was talking with Keith, and Ed, we think that should be you. <laughs> I, I said, I, I, I can't do this. And I, uh, by then, I, I knew Ted, our, our uh, pastor, and he said, look, you got the Bible, you got the Holy Spirit, go for it. And so I did. I, and there's no telling how— <laughs> it was a huge club of 300 kids, uh -huh. 300 kids in that young life club. And, uh, there, I knew, I knew John three sixteen. man, I was a block ahead of the hounds. <laughs> don't, don't you wish they recorded those, uh, devotionals? Oh no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the same way. I'm glad they didn't record my early sermons. Uh, but, uh, I don't, who knows what heresy I spoke, but boy, those kids knew that Jesus loved them. That's one thing they, they got from that. And we had a good time. Hmm. Hmm. So, so I was leading a young life group three, three weeks in of 300 see, kids. <laughs> see a little parallel there as well with Lonnie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That Chuck uh, took a, a risk with Lonnie in the, the Jesus. Oh yeah. Well. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Um, well, uh, that's all very interesting. I, it was, I, I was interested in your book as well. You said, you know, you, you were concerned even in that Bible study, whether some people in there remember you from previous lifestyle. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. There. Well, yeah. We don't have to go into all uh, the details, without getting but... into details, <laughs> yeah. a couple, a couple of girls would show up and I think, uh Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we had history and, uh, um, I remember talking to, uh, Keith about it. And he said, look, we all have history. We all have history. You're new now. You're new now. So yeah, hmm. but there were awkward things where they would come to me and go, really? You're leading this? I go, yeah, I kind of am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you also have a really interesting story. Tell us about the Hezekiah story. <laughs> and during Easter break, uh, Young Life in Bakersfield was really large. And so we would take bus loads of kids up to a place called Woodleaf. It's up in, in the mother load country of Northern California. And there's a huge young life camp up there. And we would get to go up there for a week and we would do maintenance up there. We'd paint and clean. Then we'd do, we'd have young life things going on too. And I went, you know, on the bus, cause I was a young life leader at Bakersfield high school. <laughs> so I go on the bus and I mean, I didn't even know the Bible had books. I can still remember a buddy of mine came to a Bible study once uh, from the fourth service. He came with me to a Bible study and a uh, good guy. And, um, and, uh, and Ted said, Hey, turn to Romans. And my buddy was turning 
through his Bible, and the guy next to him said, he said, hey, Romans is in the New Testament. Even I know that. And I remember my buddy Dale was saying, it seems so old. <laughs> it had to be in Romans. So anyway, I barely knew the Bible had books. So they made me the cabin leader at uh, up there at Woodleaf. And I had a group of kids in there. And, and uh, they were church kids, you know, and they were mean. I don't know what else to say about them, but one night they were, I mean, they were on to me. I was just faking it. I was just absolutely faking it. You know, I'm a good persuasive t uh, leader. And so I was just saying who knows what. And they said, you know, I think that's in Hezekiah. I think that's in Hezekiah. <laughs> and then I'm looking through my Bible, through the table of contents. I'm going, come on, God, come on. And I said, yeah, Hezekiah. <laughs> And anyway, they started laughing. And that was another time where uh, Keith rescued me. I was out away from the cabin. Somebody t told him that. And he came and put his arm around me. He said, look, um, you're going to learn early that there are Christian jerks. I still remember him saying that. <laughs> and uh, that hadn't changed. So you're pretty good at faking it till you make it, but not in yeah. that instance. Yeah, probably still. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you also have a funny story about the uh, Lord's Supper and involved grape soda and Oreos. Tell us about that one. Well, that, that wasn't me. That was uh, that was okay. my bride Judy, and oh, she was okay. a part. Judy was a part of the Jesus movement. Now, Judy trusted Christ way before I did, and even after I trusted Christ and I was a young life leader, we dated once, and it just didn't work out because she was a mature Christian, and I was just off the block. And I got good counsel. They said, you know, you need to. Stay away from women, which is probably good for me. And and uh, anyway, but Judy tells the story. They were up at uh, Arrowhead Springs, uh, which where Campus Crusade gathered back then, and uh, at a place called the Village. And she was in a cabin with with two other uh, girls uh, her age. She was a junior in high school, and they said we need to have communion. Yeah, let's have communion. And this is how. This is how raw we were. They said, uh -huh. what do we have? And they said, well, we don't have any bread. We got some Oreo cookies <laughs> and some Kool-Aid. <laughs> so they went down and there, there's a little stream that, you, that runs through Arrowhead Springs. And they went down by that stream and they got on their knees and they celebrated communion. And I promise you that the Lord Jesus was pleased with that. Mm -hmm. That's how raw we were. I can remember I learned the, the I learned amazing grace to the tune of House of the Rising Sun by the animals <laughs> about a house of prostitution in New Orleans. And, uh, and, and so the first time I went to real church and they sang Amazing Grace, I was thinking to myself, they don't even know the tune. <laughs> we were just that raw. Man, we're, having, we're having communion with mm -hmm. Oreos and, uh, and grape soda. <laughs> anyway, uh, and, and Jesus, I think, loved it. I think he loved it. Yeah, very true. Well, later in your book, you write, and I'm quoting now again, the first questions I would be asking if I hadn't been a part of the Jesus movement would be the same questions that are haunting those of us who were. If it really happened the way you describe it, then why isn't there more evidence of the impact of this revival today? If, as you say, the 60s ended with thousands, maybe millions of excited, sold out believers just beginning their adult lives, then why are there still so many unreached people in the world? You were on the road to revival. What happened? The original um, title of uh, Reborn to Be Wild was Sidetracked. Hmm. And, uh, but when uh, David C. Cook came up with Reborn to be Wild, I kind of liked that step of action on that one. So <laughs> I went with the title. Um, but I would just say a couple of things. Um, one is that um, in many, many ways, we allowed the church to tame us. We allowed the church to tame us. And we became interested in, in important things, but they weren't as important as... Uh, as community, as sharing our lives, as being out there with other people. And um, uh, we quit using ane anecdotes from real life to tell people about Jesus. We uh, became more theologically sound, I think. 
Uh, I know we did, but um, it was uh, it wasn't enthusiastic anymore. And then, you know, life happened. My passion for writing Reborn was to maybe call our friends uh, back to being excited about Jesus, uh, because you know I uh, they <laughs> they wouldn't let me do it. I wanted I I wanted to title it um, "Whatever Happened to the Jesus Movement." How did radicals for Jesus become mere Republicans? But they wouldn't let me do that one. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you gave me the early edition, and I appreciate that statement. That was a pretty powerful yeah. statement from revolutionaries to Republicans. It's yeah, from revolutionaries to Republicans. You know, and, and I, I'm you know I'm conservative in my yeah uh, politics, but my goodness, uh, the, the, yeah, Jesus loves people, and um, we just lost. Uh, we lost the, the gusto and, um, and a lot of my Jesus movement friends are just not involved in fellowship. I mean, they're believers, they have home Bible studies, uh, but church has worn them out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I always say, I didn't know Christianity was boring until I went to church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, and I really think there's something we can learn from that. We can Howard learn. Hendrix would hate that, wouldn't he? Who who's that? Howard Hendricks. You say, you know, bore them with science or math or English, but don't you oh, dare gosh, bore yeah. them with the word of God, right? Yeah, yeah. And talking to a Bible X prof, I was gonna be either Bible X or, or New Testament. And then I decided to major in Howard Hendricks. <laughs> and uh you know, I've never been involved in in uh in Christian education at all. Yeah. But the only way I could take some of those classes, yeah, he used to say it's a sin to bore uh people with the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I miss Prof. Man, I died. The, I, I cried the day he died. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, he would. He embraced that movement. I'm sure. Oh I, gosh, I yes, friend, he did. Obviously, but he was one of the main guys. He came to our little church in Bakersfield because uh, our pastor asked him to come. And I can remember talking to him afterwards and saying, "I want to go to Dallas Seminary." And he said, "Yeah, I'll be waiting for you." You know the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I was in this discipleship while I was at DTS, one of the greatest privileges of my life. Yeah. Nice. Well, Pastor Ed, you also write in your book, and I'm quoting again, uh, for Judy and me, like most Jesus movement converts, the single most disappointing and discouraging aspect of our maturing walk with Christ was trying to assimilate into the existing church culture. Deep down, we knew that most churches and their leaders didn't want us. They only wanted to capture and control our energy and commitment to the Lord Jesus and use it for their own purposes. We resisted their efforts to housebreak us, the incarcerating pressure to become good little church members. Would you elaborate any further? Yeah, you know, uh, I didn't know how to categorize it back then. I, I know how to categorize it now because there are a lot of things like that that happen. Um, that, uh, you know, the, the heavy hitters try to get on board with whatever's happening, you know, um, whatever's trending on Twitter and things like that. And, you know, you think about Jesus when they want him to be King. Couldn't you, if, if they're living today, couldn't you hear his disciples saying, Hey, look, you're trending on Twitter, dude, let's go. <laughs> he just walks away. Um, uh, but we could sniff it out. We could sniff it out. We knew the ones that only wanted us for our energy and for our presence. Because the first thing they would do is they would start talking about to us about stuff that we knew didn't matter. We just knew it didn't. We knew that our long hair and our tie dye shirts and our um, and our music that we loved. Uh, we knew things like that didn't matter uh, to Jesus. What what we wanted was to be loved and to be nurtured. And the ones who did that were the ones that we went with. And uh, one, I remember one time I, I was representing Young Life and I went to speak at a church and I won't tell you what kind, but it was, it was very churchy. And I spoke and I just, you know, I, I talked about, uh, I told my story and what was going on at Bakersfield High School. And uh, afterwards, I was invited to the fellowship hall and I didn't even know what that meant, you know, and I walked in there and I just started getting attacked by, um, you know, okay, now that you're a Christian, why do you dress like that? Why, why do you all go to the same church? 
And I remember thinking, I don't know if fellowship is something I want to, <laughs> I want to experience, but, um, and it's interesting how that, how the difference that that made in my life as a pastor, uh, I always advocated for those who were off the streets because, uh, typically I served with pre-church people, guys who had grown up in church and I, and, and they'd say, we need to do this. And I would always say, look, you don't understand what it's like uh, to, uh, I always tell people now, I say, look, if you're pre-churched, walk into a bar and see how you feel. That's how people off the street feel when they come to our churches. And we got to be careful not to speak the language and, and we got to be sensitive to that. Uh, I, I've never done a Lord's table without telling people what it meant because I can still remember going to church and they had the Lord's table and thinking, what, what, I don't even know what this is, you know? So, yeah. Um, it's, uh, to be sensitive, uh, to people who are brand new uh, has never left my heart. Well, thank, thank you, Pastor Ed, for sharing from your experience and, uh, your life story. And as we wrap up today, really building on what you ended there with, um, what are some lessons that we can learn, the church can learn from this revolution and uh, individuals, you and uh, individuals listening to this podcast and watching it, what can they learn? Uh, I, I think what I would say is that, that um, Christianity really is simple. It really is simple. Jesus loves people. And uh, I would say that you should talk about love and grace and mercy because that's what attracts people and remember uh, that grace takes the long view uh, i uh, i work with churches and with pastors and i keep having to tell them that even in their relationships with one another grace takes the long view uh, if you would have <laughs> i remember I remember uh, J. Vernon McGee preaching at Chafer Chapel there at Dallas Seminary. And I'm sitting with my Jesus movement buddies and we're all derelicts, you know, <laughs> it's like, uh, and, and if somebody would have leaned over to me and said, Hey, you're going to pastor his church someday. Mm -hmm. I said, you're nuts. I'm not going to pastor some historic <laughs> church. You know, I don't belong there. Um, but and grace takes a long view. That is where I ended up. And uh, it was a great privilege. We were, the thing is, we were loved into the communion. We were uh, into the, into the kingdom. We weren't persuaded into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in my own experience of people coming to Christ, I find that they come to Christ and they believe after they feel like they belong, mm -hmm. after they feel like they belong. Uh, I belonged before I believed. Remember that night, Bobby and Mo were praying for me. Hmm. I felt like I already belonged, and then I was willing to believe. And and I've used, uh, uh, you know, I, I've used apologetics, but mostly for new Christians. Hmm. Um, I just think uh, we need. We were given permission to fail. You know, I I cussed like a sailor one night at a Young Life meeting, hmm. and somebody put his arm around me and said, "Hey, look, man." No, you're going to grow out of this. It was community and discipleship, community, discipleship, grace, gospel, Jesus. Um, I just think that we need to keep Jesus at the center of everything we, we're doing. What I always say is, um, I don't know how our revival compared to other revivals in history. I do know we had the best name, <laughs> the Jesus movement. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Well, very exciting times. I'm so glad that uh, this movie has caused people to think about this subject again and and reflect on what we can learn from the past and implement it into our ministries and into our personal lives as we need to love and reach out and, and uh, meet, meet people where they're at. Right? And so, well, Pastor Ed uh, and our listening audience, our time is up for today's episode, but our conversation with Pastor Ed is not over. I hope you'll return to our podcast next week when we discuss some discouragement that Pastor Ed faced when he was diagnosed with a life-threatening disease. Pastor Ed will share his story and provide some wisdom 
as to how to face disappointment and heartbreak, you'll not want to miss it. So join us again next Thursday. And if you like this podcast, you may also enjoy our Faith Affirming Findings videos. In these videos, I discuss some of the most important discoveries from the field of biblical archaeology, and these findings will affirm your faith in the historicity of Scripture and provide unique insights into the background of the Bible. Well, that is it for today, but until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters, because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.